Oh, I'm Suzanne James for Green Left. Thank you for joining us. I'd like to start by acknowledging the Indigenous owners of this land on which we live and work and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I also pay my respects to all people of diversity in its many forms and champion their right to self-determination. Speaking of which, we'll be talking about a variety of NDIS-related matters today with WA Green Senator Jordan Steele-John. He's a very strong advocate for the disability community. He's also a Green's spokesperson for disability and disability rights. And he's here today to talk to us about the government's non-response to the Disability Royals Commission and also about the changes they want to make to the NDIS. Jordan, thank you for joining us. Wonderful to be here. Let's start with the government's response, or rather lack thereof, to the final report of the Disability Royal Commission. A lot of people are very disappointed that they've chosen to ignore a number of key recommendations, including school segregation and a few other key items. Would you like to talk to us about that? Well, I think it's really important to remember what the Royal Commission for the Disability Abuse was um, and how it came into being. For, for literally decades, disabled people and our allies campaigned uh, for this investigation. Uh, we understood viscerally the ways in which disabled people are abused, neglected, exploited uh, in this country because we live that abuse every day. Many of us um, have lost friends and family members to those uh, practices and those crimes. Um, and part of our work as a community over those decades uh, was to ensure that those forms of harm, the things to which we were subjected, um, would not be for nothing. You know, that we, that we would together push for an actual investigation and not only into the individual uh, circumstances, but into the systemic failures that enabled those practices to occur, the cover-ups from government that then often, so often occurred um, into uh, what had actually happened and who was responsible. So we campaigned together and politics and, uh, you know, particularly the Labour and Liberal Party fought the disability community every step of the way um, on, on establishing this investigation uh, because they feared rightly that it would expose their complicity in these crimes. Nevertheless, we persisted as a community um, and, and finally managed uh, with the collaboration together with the Greens to get an established Royal Commission and an investigation. And it was a historic moment um, that, that resulted in one of the largest Royal Commissions in Australia's history. Over five years in duration, hundreds of millions of dollars invested, um, two disabled uh, commissioners uh, leading the work um, and resulted in 220 recommendations for how we can act as a community and how the parliament can act um, as a decision-making space in order to end abuse, violence, exploitation and neglect. Um, I say all this because I think it is important to recognise how much was given by disabled people to establish that investigation and then to see it succeed. Many of us told our stories to the Royal Commission, um, shared our experiences with the Royal Commission, gave evidence, um, and that involved a lot of re-traumatisation through that process. We had to relive things that we thought we never would have to again. Many of us uh, told our stories for the second, third, fourth time, and, and we were only able to do it once again, having done it all those other times and seen nothing change, because this time we thought it would be different. We hoped it would be different. We were told it would be different. We gave so much, and what you see in the government's response is so little in return. It's so little in return. And in that moment where we received that response, it did and is still doing, as we speak today, incredible harm to the disability community. Um, it has re-traumatised many people because 
they have seen at the highest level of government the same failure to listen and to act that exposed them to these crimes in the first place and then protected these perpetrators and i think that is at the the root of the uh contributions that disabled people have made in, in response it is that this is again a, another example of the system failing and those in positions of power using that power to continue to um, perpetuate the systems that harm us rather than work with us to create justice the government's response is so far short of expectations and such a low bar for the outfit that allegedly designed the NDIS or co-designed it with the disabled community. I have to ask Jordan, what the hell? I mean, honestly, the, the, even for a Labor government, the response is just gobsmacking. Mm -hmm. What do you think the primary driver is? Well, we're nearly, uh, we're approaching the end of the La Albanese Labor government's first term. And so we as disabled people can now, I think, fairly look back across that period of time and judge it and analyse what what has actually been delivered in that period of time. And what we have seen is a government which promised when it came into office and, and there was a lot of goodwill and there was a lot of relief that the Liberals had been chucked in the bin. And part of why they were chucked in the bin was a commitment that uh, Labor had made to disabled community, that they would work with us, that they would co-design, that they would collaborate, that they would listen. Um, and at every stage after election day, um, almost without exception, they have made decision after decision that has undermined the rights of disabled people, that has betrayed the trust placed in the government by disabled people and our families. One of the first decisions made by the um, the uh, Minister for Social Services um, was to connect NDIS participants up to disability uh, employment service providers uh, when there was such a clear understanding of how terribly those DES providers were failing. Um, the very cabinet decisions that were made around who was uh, around the table and what role they picked. Um, the government refused to appoint a disability minister um, at the beginning of their term, which which is really quite remarkable, given that they appointed a minister for women, as they should have, um, and as governments have had for, for decades now, a minister for First Nations people, again, as they should have, and has long precedent um, now, and yet failed to deliver a disability minister when it would have been the common sense thing to do that, um, given the work that uh, that they had flagged to do in the space. Um, and then when we see the uh, government's engagement with the uh, not only the National Disability Insurance Scheme, but also basic changes that, that were expected of them to be championed urgently the ending of forced sterilization in australia as a practice the ending of the uh policies around the disability support pension which see people uh trapped within abusive relationships because uh if you attempt to leave uh, you are disincentivized and also simultaneously uh, if you uh, get married um in or become in a permanent partnership um, as a disabled person who's on the DSP, um, you you are negatively impacted in terms of your ability to access uh, those funds. And these are things that have been flagged over and over again across the last couple of decades. They failed to take action on those pieces. And then we had this NDIS bill, which uh, could not have been further from anything um, that Labour had promised or signalled before the election, a bill which systematically strips uh, rights and protections from NDIS participants enables the cutting of billions of dollars from the scheme um, and removes the ability for us as disabled people to get individualized uh, supports determined on a case by case basis, which is the heart of the NDIS. So in that context of betrayal, of failure and of harm already done um, by the policies pursued by the government, this response 
uh, to the Royal Commission is not an exception. It's the norm of how they have engaged with the disability community over their term and the impact of their policies on us. They aren't going to end the absolutely abysmal failure that is disability employment providers. Mm. They're not going to insist that people in disability employment centres should receive the same minimum wage as everybody else. Absolutely. And the commissions themselves couldn't agree on it, but obviously anyone with a disability knows that the segregation in schools has to end if we're going to effectively deal with the issues. That was the other. Have I missed anything? Sure. Um, well, I, I think there's also the the question of 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 segregated housing. I mean, if you, if you look at if you look at the 220 recommendations made by the commission, um, you have a roadmap in those recommendations um, for the way that Australian uh, governments and Australian community uh, can work together with the disability justice movement to yes. achieve the uh, full inclusion. Um, and the full uh, justice demanded by disabled people um, in Australia. That, that's how, that, that's what, if you took all of the recommendations to their conclusion, you would make great strides forward towards that goal. Now, in, in looking at that report, I have been guided by the work of the disabled commissioners themselves, Commissioner Galbally and Commissioner McEwen. Uh, because I believe the Greens believe that that you need to be led by lived experience in this space, and, and they were very clear. And I think it's important this this narrative of oh the commissioners couldn't agree you know, on the way forward. The disabled commissioners could agree. The disabled people uh, in those roles saw clearly um, that these types of practices had to end, and they saw it because. The evidence given to them and the evidence provided in multiple inquiries leading up to the Royal Commission stated clearly that we have in Australia a cycle of segregation. Um, disabled people are drawn into that cycle of segregation uh, through school, through segregated school, where they are separated from their non-disabled peers uh, and often physically separated in, in separate school settings. Which um, by the way, probably does more to engender discrimination amongst children oh, than absolutely. It, it does it engenders huge amounts of discrimination. And the kicker is the academic outcomes are terrible. You know, there, there is no evidence to suggest that segregated schooling delivers better um, academic uh, outcomes for disabled children. And a lot of evidence that says mainstream inclusive education uh, does the same. So we begin the cycle with education and then we move through to segregated work where a disabled person is often you know took early out of taken early out of school into yeah. these so-called work pro programs where they are paid you know cents or dollars on the hour um and through to segregated housing where we are as disabled people often grouped together in group group settings uh where we do not uh, wish to be it's not that we choose to be there it's that that's where we are placed and that's where the system says it's cheapest to put us um, and those together um, lead to our abuse and neglect and ultimately our early death and that is what they uh, concluded and so they said here's how we break that cycle of segregation and on each one of those recommendations uh, the transition to an inclusive education system for all students um, uh, that is co-designed that transition with students, teachers, parents, unions, educational academics, um, and is not an overnight process. They, they propose to get to that point by 2034, which I, you know, have been quite critical of that amount of time. I think we should get there in a decade. I don't think it's acceptable to say that a disabled child born today would see their child go to a segregated school. I think we have to we have to be uh, more more urgent in that work. But they said let's have that transition towards a, a fully mainstreamed educational system. Let us end group homes uh, and let us end this asterisk that exists on the minimum wage in Australia, which says everybody gets paid the minimum wage except if you're a disabled person. And on each one of those, the government said no. Nope. We're not going to do it. They decided to uh, maintain a position where they are, in fact, the enablers and the promoters of this cycle um, of segregation.
you can't take 14.4 billion out of the system um, and say you're going to go after dodgy providers mm. and um, not replace it with anything. So where do they think that money's going to come from? Because ultimately I can't see how it's going to do anything other than impact directly on people's personal funding under mm. their NDIS plan. Well, that's exactly where it's going to come from. It's going to come from their NDIS plan. I mean, it, it, this this idea that you can remove that amount of money, I and mean, that's just the first chunk of cuts they're making. By the way, across the across mm-hmm. to twenty thirty four, they've they've telegraphed seventy four billion dollars worth of cuts to the NDIS. Um, it was the single largest uh, savings measure um, of the previous budget. So not the one we've just had, but the one before. Um, so they are they are looking to make massive cuts to the NDIS at the same time as they expend happily $368 billion on AUKUS submarines uh, that won't be delivered until I am 60 odd. Um, So I think the the most important thing to say here at the beginning is when we hear a conversation about uh, the sustainability, you know, the financial sustainability of the NDIS, is it costing too much? Sustainability is the result of decisions government is willing to make or decisions they are not willing to make. They're value judgments. You know, they've decided that to spend $368 billion on nuclear submarines is a sustainable thing to do. And when asked, um, you know, what's the upward price limit, the defence minister said, well, there isn't one. We need to do, deliver this capability. So the federal government has all of the tools in its disposal, whether it be through the tax system, uh, whether it be through the subsidies they provide to large corporations, um, to to fund the NDIS adequately. Um, the question of whether they there is enough money to do that is a result of their decisions that they do or don't make around those areas of revenue raising. Um, in terms of the... Um, impact that it will have on disabled people we know really clearly the impact that it will have what this bill does is it removes the ability of disabled people to uh, have genuine choice and control over the services and supports that they uh, require um, and restricts the types of supports they are able to use and here's one of the most perverse parts about it it takes powers which are currently in the hands of disabled people and our families to choose what kind of services that we that we engage who delivers them where they are delivered when they are delivered and transfers them to the minister for disabilities or the state-based ministers so you take power from people from individuals and you put it in the hands of the disability minister or the state uh, chief uh, and uh, chief ministers and premiers. And one of the most uh, really extraordinarily concerning aspects of the bill is that it introduces this entirely new concept of an NDIS support. And you uh, will only be able to be funded in your plan for something that is uh, considered an NDIS support. So the next question is, well, what is an NDIS support and who decides what it is? Um, and the bill... It says very clearly an NDIS support is what the Minister for Disabilities and their uh, state and territory ministers decide. Like, right. it, disabled people are people. Uh, and, our, and our needs are complex and they're individual. What I need is a disabled person who has a you know CP and other things and uses a manual wheelchair will be distinctly different from even another person who uses wheelchair and has cerebral palsy because disability is a is the product of the interaction of impairment with environment um and also with like not only where you are now but also where you want to be you know the the other thing i'd really like to highlight is just how personal disability care is. People don't seem to understand. Someone like yourself, for example, you know, your primary diagnosis you've openly shared is cerebral palsy and you're a wheelchair user. And yeah. for someone in that situation, care sometimes means you being physically handled by someone. Yep. Possibly if you were, for example, someone who used a wheelchair and needed showering assistance, you're now naked in a bathroom with someone yep. who's probably a complete stranger and may or may not have even done a basic certificate three in care. Now, that's yep. the FA stuff that people with various disabilities of various types face. You and I know that, and our families know that. 
And it's extremely frustrating as a disabled person living in the community to hear all this rhetoric about the NDIS cuts and how it's rorts and waste and people are using sex workers and mm. never mind going after the providers who seem to have the ability to phoenix like any other corporation just pop back up after they've paid the fine or shut down one operation and go to another. And people just do not seem to understand that you're talking about someone's actual life here, about a person being able to get out of bed in the morning, being able Absolutely. to go to the It is so deeply inappropriate that that a government, let alone a Labor government, would propose that politicians are the ones that should be making those decisions for disabled people. That Especially when they're the government that allegedly designed it to do exactly the opposite. Absolutely. That a politician should be able to come into your life, and this is one of the things that Bell enabled. A politician will come into your life and say, you know that thing you've been using? No, nah, that, that's not allowed anymore. You know, you, you know that that uh, service provider that you've been using and the way that you've been managing them and engaging with them and, you know, you've done how many risk assessments to enable you to be able to manage your funds in this yeah. way and you've always kept your receipts. No, nah, you can't do that anymore. Why? Because that's not safe for you. But we know better. We, we, we can't let you do that. You won't be safe doing that. Or, or my apps, the one that boils my blood beyond belief is this bill will enable... Um, a, a change in policy that will mean that if you as a disabled person have a support worker that comes into your home um, and helps you get out of bed and helps you do some cooking and some cleaning and helps you do some, you know, um, do, you know, do do things around the home, supported independent living, they call it. If you have those services for more than eight hours a day, um, and, and many people do, you know, like if, if you really, if you need a person to help you get out of bed, then they need to be there with you through the day, you know, like till you go yeah. back to bed and sometimes, you know, help you up in the night to go to the loo. So if you need that, at the moment, you can make the case that you should be able to receive those support hours on a one-to-one -one basis, right? So it's just you and, and, the, and the support worker or support workers that you would have. This bill changes it or allows it to be changed so that um, you can no longer do that. You can only receive that amount of care if you do so uh, in connection to two other people. So basically, we're back to group home settings. You can only receive it if you're in that congregate environment because you can only practically have that delivered if you're all close together. Um, and that that rebuilds the institutions that we have just spent. Finished knocking down. Yes. Trying to knock down. So last question. The Pauline Hanson thing. Now, she said some terrible things over the years about disabled people. If you could have picked a worse poster child, I can't think of one with the possible exception of Tony Abbott that probably thinks disability is a lifestyle mm. trip, along with homelessness and various other issues. Um, what was Bill Shorten thinking? Now, Kurt Fernley should have been there. Where did that even come from, Jordan? Or well, is I, it I, I, I think it's something you... guy that he's desperate to find someone that will help him sell it. Did Kurt Fernley say no? Is that what happened? Well, I, I think... Here's the thing. How how bad does your bill have to be that the only political party that you can find to endorse it is Pauline Hanson? Like that that is that is one of the biggest red flags that I could ever think of draping around a piece of legislation is that the only party in the chamber that'll back you in is One Nation, the only MP that'll do a press conference with you is Pauline Hanson. I mean, we're, we're in a situation where this bill is so harmful to disabled people and is so clearly going to make the lives of our families and, and, and our communities more difficult that the Liberal Party, who spent most of their time in government trying to cut the NDIS and make it harder to get uh, basic services and supports, even the Liberal Party are deeply concerned about this bill. Concerned enough that when the Greens have put forward motions uh, to to uh, have additional inquiries into the bill or to uh, to to interrogate the assumptions behind it, the Liberals have ended up voting for those Greens positions because they are uh, so concerned. So what what we have here is a piece of legislation which. Uh, even, you know, Linda Reynolds and Michael Sucker and Holly Hughes look at and go, whoa, this is really not only uh, light years away from what you said you do before uh, you came to government, but 
the basic protections you're stripping away from people here the right to review the the right to the right to um to select individualized services the rights to use the provider that works for you these are basic rights that not even the liberals uh, were were wild enough and then we hear at the last hearing uh, the the the, the um, lead lawyer for robo debt that uh, that uncovered uh, robo debt in the the commonwealth case in 2019 um, uh, when asked the question you know doesn't some of these debt raising provisions uh, within the bill and there are many including one that enables participants to have a debt raised against them um, even in cases where the debt has been incurred by a service provider. So you never had the money, you never received the service, but you as a participant have to pay the debt. And that, of course, prompted the, the question, you know, aren't some of these dynamics a bit more dangerous than robo-debt or risk creating a robo-debt-like dynamic? And his answer was, well, Senator, at least in robo-debt, you could request a review of the debt, which prompted an a intake of breath and a question of what you, what was that who gave you that response uh, miles uh, brown uh mr miles brown from the national national legal aid center um what? we put the we put the exchanges up on um, it, uh, okay. on 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 socials but the point he was trying to draw us to was that a, spe a specific section of the ndia act as written says that the agency in considering whether to waive a debt cannot take account of whether somebody's disability uh, played a role in uh, the debt, meaning that they can't even consider the role that that, that um, the debt, uh, the disability plays in the raising of the debt. So there's all of these red flags around this piece of legislation that are being clearly communicated to the government, and yet they are continuing to attempt to ram it through rather than recognise that they've got this wrong and they need to go back to the drawing board because their goal is to get that $14.4 billion worth of cuts implemented as quickly as possible um, so that they can continue to funnel that money into the pockets of arms manufacturers and big corporations and the, the, the folks that are cooking the planet. Like it is an absurd dynamic, um, but disabled people aren't just going to take it. And I'll end on this, you know, disabled people will fight this bill um, through every vote, through every motion, through every hour of parliamentary time. Um, we will continue to build our power. Uh, and should it be that the government ram this bill through, um, then we very clearly understand that we will enter together a, a period of, of deep struggle and harm to our community. And we will link arm in arm together and we will push through and come election day, uh, the ALP will be reminded that not only are we engaged citizens, uh, we are voters. And we intend to vote uh, for a parliament that will restore our rights and protections. John Steele, John, it's been great talking to you today. Thank you so much for taking us through that. Thank you. That was Senator John Steele, John, Green Senator from Western Australia, taking us through what the like, current Labor government, believe it or not, is trying to do to the NDIS. I'm Suzanne Jones from Green Left. We'll be talking more about this as time goes on, and we'll talk to you then.